Hello and welcome to Date Night Live, uh, Date Night with Martina on Facebook Live. For those who might be watching this and haven't met me before, my name is Martina Hughes. I started Tantric Blossoming in 2005, so 15 years ago now. And I started Tantric Blossoming as a way to support everyday men and women to have practical tools, embodied wisdom for enhancing their relationships, being more connected to their body and being able to understand and embrace their sexual energy in new ways. And over the last 15 years, I've worked with thousands of men and women just like you who want to make a difference in their lives. Sometimes I'm working with people who kind of just have that instinct that maybe there could be more to sex and intimacy and relationships. Sometimes I'm working with people who want to bring the spiritual side into sex. Sometimes I'm working with people who are on the verge of a breakup and, and looking for some different answers to how they can turn things around in their life because the the traditional or conventional methods haven't worked. And my experience is that the more deeply people understand their own inner world, the easier it becomes to connect with others, the easier it becomes to have deeper intimacy and more fulfilling and more meaningful relationships and also understanding how to how to access our sexual energy in, in different ways, which is part of what I'll be speaking about tonight. So I'd love to hear from you. Do share with me how you're feeling, where you're listening from. Go ahead and use the chat box to, to drop me a note and just let me know how you're feeling and what part of the world you're tuning in from. Uh, for me right now, I'm feeling incredibly vulnerable. This, this recent solstice, as well as the, the various astrological transits, we've got six planets in retrograde right now. So there's a lot of very introspective, reflective and inwards energy. So I can feel part of me pulling in more. And with that, it feels like there's there's a really young part of me that's being activated. So that's feeling, yeah, quite vulnerable, tender, a little bit uncomfortable, but not not in a painful or unbearable way, just to like, oh, I'm in a little bit of a, a new place in myself. So I can certainly, yeah, since the weekend, feel the effects of the solstice and, and the various planetary activities. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering actually how other people are doing with all of that. I'm actually going to the, the topic of vulnerability. I'm going to cover next week. Um, it kind of just bubbled up for me today and I knew that I already had tonight's um, structure and outline planned a little bit so I wanted to stay with sexual desire part two for tonight but next week I'm going to speak more to vulnerability because I do think vulnerability is an essential part of the feminine in women and in men and vulnerability is often perceived or judged as weakness and there's actually real power and and a gift and a certain quality in vulnerability that is essential for our lives. So stay tuned next week for, for that topic. Looks like we've got a, a few messages here. Hello from Danny. Hi from Ali. Ola from Jean. Susan says hi. Gina says hi. Nina says hello. And Deb says watching from home tonight. And Deb's not far away from me. She's on the Bellarine Peninsula. I know that, that Danny's around on the other side at, at Sorrento on the other peninsula, south of, of Melbourne. Keen says, thanks for sharing. Have a commitment myself now. Astrology is intense. Watch out for 3rd to the 7th of July. Very cool. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too, Keen, and thank you for dropping in. 
awesome. It's lovely, lovely to feel this sense of community here in the in the date night space and the way it's just growing and expanding. And I'm often hearing from other people that they're going back and watching the videos and, and picking up tips even after the evening. So even if you can't watch it now, know that you can come back to it at another point. Ali is in southeast Queensland, ah, a little bit warmer in your part of the world. You probably don't have one of these on your lap, Ali, a hot water bottle. Um, but yes, here in Victoria, it is a little chilly, so it's definitely hot water bottle weather here. Danny says vulnerability equals strength. Totally, Danny. Absolutely agree with you there, and um, I will dive more into that next week. Okay, so I'm actually going to switch things around tonight and speak to a question that came in. This question actually came in just before I started last week, but I didn't see it until afterwards. But I do think this question feels relevant to address it at the beginning because I think that what this question is bringing to the surface is something that is really quite common on the topic of sexual desire, mismatch libidos, and also sexual desire in long-term relationships. So I think this question will be a good place for us to start. Um, and then I'm also going to take you through some steps for connecting with your sexual desire and your sexual energy. I'll talk some more about how sexual desire can change over the course of a lifetime and how and why sexual desire makes you more attractive to others. I can see there's some comments coming in, so I'll just check those before I move on. Jean is physically tired, mind is very active, feeling energetic changes, a mix of feeling grounded, bringing her voice out, feeling a lot is happening. Looking forward to dropping into my body tonight. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Jean. Deb, feeling very teary and emotional this week. My feelings are very close to the surface and I want to cry a lot. Yeah, I'm feel, feeling you there, Deb. I'm on a similar page. Um, Ali, six degrees tonight, so a hot water bottle would be a great idea. That's cold for southeast Queensland, right? Nina is also teary and emotional. Sherry says hi. Beautiful. Okay, so this is the question I received last week. Do you think that the natural order of things is for sex to fade away as a couple progresses through middle age and for companionship to become the main feature of the relationship? After a sex drought of several years in a 12-year relationship, can people come to accept that perhaps they will never have sex again? Do you think this somehow diminishes the human life force? Or is it part of accepting that life is not perfect, that we are best to be grateful for what we do have, companionship, love without the passion, and not regret what we don't have? And I can share with you that a man sent in that question and I, I had another very similar question from another man and in working with people this is a question that men commonly bring up is their concern around sexual desire fading or disappearing in a long-term relationship and there's a lot of people out there who will say that it's very natural and it just happens in long-term relationships and you need to accept that. It's partly truth, but it's not the whole truth. So the way I see it is that the urgency of sexual desire, yes, there's a part of that that does fade over time. However, there's also a part where each of us as individuals and as a couple are responsible for keeping alive our own sexual fire, our own sexual desires. 
And when we accept that sexual desire simply fades over time, when we take that on to a belief, there's a certain part where our beliefs create our reality. So if you believe that your sexual desire will fade, it will fade. If you believe that it's normal to not have sex in, an on, in a long-term relationship, then that fades. But each of the individuals in a relationship need to be able to have a look and go, what is it that sex provides for me? How is it that sex feels? Is it something that feels good? Does it actually meet a deep physical, emotional, spiritual or mental need? Because sex fulfills a lot of different needs and different types of sex fulfill different kinds of needs as well. And I'll come back to that in a while. But there'll be something that is being suppressed. There's, there's a very, very few individuals in the world who transcend sex. And what I mean when I say transcend sex is come to the point where there's no longer any need for sex, like sex doesn't fulfill any purpose in their life because on some level they're operating in a different way in their life. But for the average person, the letting go of sex is because they've never truly experienced what's possible through sex. And I, I did mention this last week, but it's worth bringing it up again because when, when a man doesn't feel sexually satisfied from a single sexual encounter with his partner, then he wants to have sex again soon. And, and yeah, he wants that to happen soon so that he can then perhaps have a better experience. If a woman has a less than satisfying experience with her partner, she won't be as keen to have sex again. There'll be a part of her that goes, oh, I opened, but my desire wasn't met. So I'm not going to rush into doing that again. She'll hold back a little bit. Also, women's desire has a different relationship with hormones. There's really only two times, or two days really, during a whole month that a woman is physically motivated to engage sexually and that's generally the day before her menstrual cycle and the day or two around her ovulation. So for women the physical urges of sexual desire are actually quite narrow inside of a month but if a woman is having fulfilling and expansive sexual experiences and she feels herself emotionally met sexually, if she feels that sense of a deeper union and a deeper connection in the sex, then she'll be motivated to connect sexually for that reason. So generally what happens in long-term relationships is that people are drawn together and there's a lot of chemistry, hormones, attraction, and sometimes even a desire for validation. Like if I'm sexually available, he'll find me attractive. If, you know, if I please her sexually, then she's going to love me. And there's all sorts of unspoken agreements in the early stages of a relationship that can fuel the sexual experience. Now, there, there can be a tendency as time goes on when some of that intensity of chemistry and attraction and validation and approval, when some of that intensity fades, there can be a tendency to go, oh yeah, that's not so important. You know, it's hot and sweaty and hard work and I have to get naked and feel a bit self-conscious. My belly's hanging out a bit today. My body doesn't feel great. I'm a bit tired. I'll wait till tomorrow. Wait till next week. Wait till next week. 
So there's often a lot of reasons people can find very easily to delay the sexual experience. Let's put it off. Let's do it another day. Let's wait until all the conditions are perfect. And part of why this happens, and I spoke about this last week, is because there's still a, a core of sexual shame that remains unaddressed. If we go deeply into sex, sexual shame gets flushed to the surface. But if we kind of skim sex, then that sexual shame stays there and can often drive sexual behaviours or, or a low sexual desire without the person even knowing. So oftentimes when I work with people, what I've discovered through body work, through coaching, is that a lot of people who say they have very low sexual desire, it's just that they have sexual shame that's been unaddressed. Of course, having different levels of sexual desire is natural, it's very human, um, and men and women, as I said, have different hormonal impulses. But when somebody has experienced a deep level of sexual union, they start to connect with those places of like, oh, I feel loved, I feel connected, I feel held, I feel close, I feel valued, I feel cherished. You know, a deep sexual union brings so much more than just the physical release of sex. If anybody's brave enough watching this, I'd love for you to share what is it that sex brings for you? I'm going to come back to this question in a moment, but I'd love to, to check in with the people watching if you could type into the chat box on an emotional level, what need does sex meet for you? And so I, I think I'll, I'll continue addressing the question while, while people perhaps answer or perhaps don't answer because maybe it feels too vulnerable to respond. Actually, Gina's responded. Gina says, deep connection. Yeah, beautiful. And I know for me, there's something, something in particular about the experience of penetration in sex that the experience of penetration just creates such a deep sense of unity, connection, meeting, and yeah, there's something in penetration that for me is not met in oral sex or other kinds of sexual play. There's something in penetration that supports a deeper melting and opening within me that goes much more beyond the physical and into those emotional layers of seeing and feeling each other in ways that go beyond the ordinary. Danny says intimacy. Deb says sex meets my need for connection. Helen says connection. Andy says it's when spirituality and sexuality collide beautifully. Helen says physical touch. Rebecca says a deeper awareness of energy and power. Sue says surrendering to something larger than here and now. Fyodor says alchemy and deep conscious connection. Beautiful, beautiful. Jean, acceptance, being seen, deep connection, unity, energetic exchange. Definitely. Yeah, there's something in the energetic exchange that is so beautiful and can be profoundly life-changing. I also love what Sue said about surrendering to something larger than here and now, which is absolutely true. It's, it is a real place of letting go and, and allowing the other person to see really who we are 
on a whole other level. Ali says deep connection and deep surrender. Nina says she has experienced a lot of sexual healing the last couple of years and has been able to process a lot of built-in emotions and she's cried, laughed and experienced so much pleasure as well. Sue says falling into vulnerability, absolutely. Andy leaving the world behind, glimpses of the divine, beautiful, beautiful. I'm loving your responses. Thank you, thank you for, for sharing the, the vulnerability. Really, really enjoying your responses. It feels good and yeah, there's something that happens in sex that doesn't happen anywhere else and not in my life anyway that that sense of really letting go being seen feeling accepted feeling loved and and yeah the vulnerability of letting my partner see all of me and me seeing all of him and that sense that yeah to, to tap on to something that Andy said. It's like leaving the rest of the world behind, like nothing else exists. It's just us in our divine union in that moment. Ali says soul connection and at times expanding into universal wholeness. Absolutely. And so I think for anybody who has experienced sexual desire, fading in a long-term relationship, the first step is to come back to this question. What does sex provide for you? What does it provide physically? Because I know for some people, uh, men in particular, it can be that sex is the only place where their needs for physical touch are met. Oftentimes with women, women will experience physical touch um, loving physical touch with children or with friends but sometimes for men they look to sex to to meet all of their physical needs because those physical needs are not being met in other areas so definitely look at physically what does sex provide there's also the sense that orgasm provides release now we need to look at that sense of release from both the man's perspective and a woman's perspective because men are more men are more guaranteed let's say to experience a release via a sexual experience um, there are some men who who struggle with um, orgasm and ejaculation but by and large most men will experience some combination of orgasm and ejaculation inside of a sexual experience whereas there are a lot of men a lot of women I mean there are a lot of women who struggle with orgasm and so it's worth having a look at why women struggle with orgasm because even the struggle with orgasm gives us a clue as to why sexual desire fades in a long-term relationship so women often struggle with orgasm firstly for sexual shame that's a big part of it second because they don't feel safe enough to be all of themselves third they're afraid of letting go fourth they're unable to let their feelings flow freely and for a woman in particular the relationship between the feelings and the orgasmic energy go hand in hand. So if the feelings are suppressed, the orgasmic energy can be suppressed. So it's important for a woman to have permission to express herself on a feeling level. I remember an event that I was presenting in Melbourne around about a year ago and Rod was unable to come to it, but I said to him before the event, if you had one thing you could say to the men about how they are in their relationships with women and what they want to experience with women what would you want me to pass on to the men from you and what Rod said to me on that occasion was to let men know that the more they accept and love their partner's feelings the more a woman will open sexually 
So I'm just going to repeat it because it's quite important. It's like, the more a man accepts and loves his partner's feelings, the more the woman opens sexually. And that is part of the key to women's challenges with orgasm. Because if a woman's holding her body tight, if she's holding her feelings tight, if she feels like she has to be taking care of everybody else and not falling into her own feminine flow, then it becomes impossible to experience orgasm. So in a lot of long-term relationships, the reason that sexual desire fades is because a woman one day goes, I can't be bothered. And then one day turns into one week, turns into a month, turns into a year, turns into five or six years. So that energy of I can't be bothered. First of all, what can we do about it as women? Because it's important to look at both sides of the coin. So for the women who have shut down their sexual desire, it's important to go, why did I shut down? Why wasn't I enjoying? And, and women have kind of bought into a bit of a story that women are not so sexual. Whereas I know a lot of women, friends and clients, who are actually way more sexual than the men in their lives. So when a woman is really open, her capacity for sex can be enormous. Um, it's just that if a woman hasn't known how to open in her body, then she can't bring that energy to her partner. And women will often feel like there's something missing, there's something that's not quite right, but then not know how to turn that around in herself. So I teach women about falling into their feminine. A lot of what myself and other women have been conditioned and programmed into in today's world is to be very outward focused with our energy, very masculine, very driven. But in order to experience our female pleasure, in order to experience orgasm and the depth of our feelings, the depth of our surrender, we need to be able to fall into the feminine. And that process of falling into the feminine means <sighs> breathing into the body, feeling energy, feeling sensations, feeling pleasure and aliveness, just moving around the body, just because. And even just in that few short seconds that I was directing my energy inwards rather than being focused outwards, I could already feel tingling and stirring in my body. Now, of course, I've been practicing and, and playing with these energies for a lot of years now so it's quite natural to me but I share that not because I'm special or different I share that to let you know that that is possible for every woman I've worked with so many women over the years who've gone I'm just not that interested in sex or I can't orgasm or I can only orgasm with a vibrator, or I just have a really low desire. And then when the woman really starts to understand herself sexually, when she starts to fall into her feminine energy, then things start to shift. Things start to feel different inside of her. So for women, that journey of falling into your feminine can be as simple as closing your eyes, place one hand over your vulva, one hand on the heart, close the eyes and take some deep breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth. And that can be where 
the journey of falling into the feminine starts. Some women get concerned with this term falling into the feminine because it sounds passive, but actually it's, it's very powerful. Falling into yourself is a very powerful thing to do and to reclaim your feminine energy rather than always being outward in your focus. It's like doing this is nourishing, it's rejuvenating, connects you to something much deeper and much bigger. It also means that you're more connected to love, to nourishment, to, to fuel inside of yourself to be able to share that energy with others in your life. And yeah, I'd love to hear from some of the women who are listening. I know some of the women who are here have been on that feminine journey with me. So if you'd like to share how that feels for you, what you've learned in that process, I'd, I'd love to, to read your comments. I know for me, the journey of really coming home to my feminine or falling into my feminine was incredibly profound and happened almost overnight. It was a mental question for a long time. Like I was like, well, if I just did this different or if I did that different, if I tried some different clothes, tried some different makeup, maybe I'd be more feminine. And none of those things truly changed the way that I felt. The thing that changed how I felt was just that connecting with the feelings, with the sensations, feeling fire, feeling water, feeling earth, feeling everything moving inside of my body and allowing tears to come up, allowing rage to come up, allowing orgasms to pour out of me. There was a sense of as soon as I gave myself permission to feel, to reclaim my internal world, then it all opened up in an incredibly beautiful and delicious kind of way. But given that so much of my conditioning had been to be focused on the external achievements and ambition and, and how I looked and how other people experienced me, it was, it was challenging to switch that orientation from being outward focused to falling into myself and trusting that what's in here is way more powerful than anything I'm going to find out there in the world. And it can feel like falling into an abyss and um, yeah, it's beautiful and, and frightening all at the same time. Deb says, my life has changed from learning from you how to fall into my feminine. I now value and prioritize my feelings, whereas before I lived in my head. I now feel things in my body and I value them very highly. Beautiful. Thank you for that share, Deb. That's lovely. Really, really beautiful to read. Sue says, Blossoming Woman Workshop was so powerful in encouraging me to fall into my feminine, feeling so much more connected to my body and the orientation of receptivity and surrender. Beautiful. Thank you, Sue. Lovely to read. And, and Sue just did that workshop maybe about six weeks ago. So it's good to hear that it's made such a huge difference. Yeah. And um, yeah, the Blossoming Woman two-day event is coming up uh, in, at the end of July, July 18 and 19. It's a Saturday and Sunday. And each day we have two Zoom sessions, 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. and then 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. So it's over the weekend, it's four three-hour sessions on Zoom, so 12 hours in total. But during that two days of Blossoming Woman, we look at activating the sexual energy, tuning in to receptivity, falling into the feminine, improving your relationships with men, learning how to be more in touch with your body, your sensitivity, 
to have a different relationship with your feelings. There's a lot of tools we cover in that two-day event that really creates a whole new foundation for women's lives. So if you are interested, the details for that are up on tantricblossoming.com because, yeah, there's... I can sit here, of course, and share these things with you, but it's only really through doing the practices and experiencing the work that you get to have an embodied experience of it, to really feel yourself from within. Jane says, falling into my feminine gives me a greater depth of connection with myself. It is giving me a new sense of power and I'm magnetizing much more awesome and beautiful opportunities and people. But coming with terms of falling in, it took a while. Yeah. Thank you, Jean. Beautiful share. Thank you. So let's switch a little bit now to looking at if you're a man in a long-term relationship and you'd like to connect sexually with your partner and your partner's not open to your sexual advances, what do you do? So first of all, have a look at the quote I gave you from Rod a little while ago. The more you accept her feelings, the more she opens sexually. So start to be curious about her feelings. Why is she not interested in sex? Even going so far as to say to your partner, I notice we haven't connected sexually for a long time. And, and I'm wondering why that might be. Can we have an open and frank conversation around how sex feels for you or how it felt for you in the past? Were there things missing from sex? Are there things that I was doing that didn't feel right for you? Being courageous enough to open up that kind of conversation with your partner to go you know I'm aware there are things I might have missed can we talk about that I think having that kind of conversation invites forward your partner's feelings also being curious on a day-to-day -day basis like let's say if you notice your partner she might be sitting down reading a book but you might see something on her face and go, oh, she looks a little sad. Be curious about that sadness. Are you feeling sad? What's going on for you, honey? Would you like to talk about how you feel? So even in everyday moments, eliciting, encouraging, evoking a woman to come forward with her feelings. If she's rushing around the house and there's a sense of frustration in her body, Rather than going, she's frustrated because of me, I should go hide. You know, rather than taking it personally and then going into hiding, to even go, what is it that has you frustrated today? Is there something there we can talk about? You know, is, is there something I can do to support you? What is it that you need right now? And with a lot of women, and a lot of women are very busy nowadays, even just saying, what do you need, can be a game changer. Being asked one simple question makes a massive difference. And so that first step, being curious about your partner's feelings, is going to have a big impact. It might not seem like a sexual impact straight away, but something through her body will start to soften there will be more trust builds up there'll be a sense of oh he cares about me he's curious he wants to know how i feel he wants to know what's going on for me and all of that touches a woman's heart supports her heart to open and when a woman opens through the heart through the breast because in Tantra we recognize this is a woman's positive polarity. This is where her energy is generated. So when she feels safe, when she feels cared for, when she feels loved, this area fills up, overflows, and starts to have an effect on opening a woman's vagina. 
Now, this is not necessarily automatic. And if it is a long term relationship where sexual desire has been asleep for four or six or 12 years, it's going to take a little more than how are you feeling to reignite sex. But that's a really good starting point. The other thing that is important is that women need a certain amount of physical touch without any sexual demand. So physical touch without any sexual demand might be an embrace without any sexual expectation. It might be a stroke of the arms, it might be holding her face, it might be caressing her hair, might be rubbing her back, might be rubbing her feet. But that sense that she's being touched, loved and given affection just for who she is without there being any expectation of like, I've given you some affection, now it's time for the transaction. You know, anything that feels like an exchange has a woman's body go, mm, I, I can't open. If it feels transactional, if it feels exchange like I've given you touch, now give me sex, that of course is going to turn a woman off. But if you're touching her just for the purpose of loving her, then a woman can, ah, I think transactional relationships, that sense of I do something for you, now you do something for me, there's something really off in that. And it's actually how a lot of relationships are nowadays, but it's also why a lot of relationships fall apart because that transactional, that conditional, I'll do this as long as you do that. Um, there's no real sense of love or flow or generosity in that. Um, I can see that Andy has said here, I recall Rod saying at the retreat, Helen and I did, that foreplay begins the moment you finish making love. It's everything that goes on in between that makes the real difference. Absolutely, Andy. That definitely a revelation for a lot of people. Um, it made perfect sense, but it's hidden in plain sight for many men. Absolutely, because women are sensitive and feel everything. So everything that happens from the time sex finishes until sex arises again, everything that happens in between has an effect on sexual desire, has an effect on sexual openness. So all of that is foreplay for sure. And yes, it's definitely hidden in plain sight for a lot of people, Andy. So thank you for sharing that. I appreciate that. Um, I just saw that Jean says above here, I had a much deeper experience repeating Blossoming Woman level one after doing levels one and two and it was online. Yeah, it's, it's amazing what we're creating in the online space. I'm really, really loving that. The other thing that a man can do is become more present and more still. If Rod has just meditated that, and, and I can feel that stillness and that depth in his body, that is really attractive. So much more attractive than if he's been, you know, just like um, diluting his energy and, and doing, doing different things in his life. But when he's been meditating and his energy's still and his energy's deep, it's like, ah, oh, there he is. It's like, then my feminine body like softens, opens, responds. So I think for anybody in a long-term relationship, this is a starting point. There's lots of different things you can do to reignite sexual desire, to reignite sexual interest. But it does come down to having some real and honest communication 
starting to really see each other. Um, I had a, another similar question to the one I shared with you at the beginning. Um, actually, let me just read it again quickly because I feel like there was some slight different distinction in it. Scrolling. Um, Oh no, actually it's 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 a very similar question, but that question of can you create desire? Yes, you can definitely create desire. The more connected each person is in the relationship to their body, to their breath, to the way energy moves inside of them, the easier it is to reconnect to desire. There's also a sense, and I've I've seen this quite a bit in couples I've worked with where they haven't had sex for so long that it's now just way too clumsy and awkward to talk about sex. So they're talking about sex for the first time ever with me in the room as well. And I was, I was kind of surprised about it in the beginning when I started working with people in this way. And I was surprised because one, because I love talking about sex, but also two, I was surprised that people could create whole lives together. People could you know, build and buy houses and set up mortgages and raise children and do all these really, really challenging things together, at least challenging from my perspective, um, but struggled to have an honest conversation about sex. And for me, being able to talk about sex is a prerequisite in a relationship. Like if I'm not comfortable talking about sex with somebody, there's no way I could share my body sexually with them. There's no way I could set up a life with them. And that might come down to different values. But even if you feel clumsy and shy and awkward talking about sex, even going to your partner and going, I feel really clumsy and vulnerable and shy and awkward and I want to go and hide and not have this conversation with you. But we really have to talk about sex. You know, even if all of that vulnerability and anxiety is present, have the conversation. Because the very thing it's the same energy. The thing that stops you from talking about sex is the same thing that will stop you from having sex and that is sexual shame. So even if your face is bright red like a beetroot, even if you're shaking and unsure of yourself, just blurt the words out so that then that takes a layer off and then it's like, okay, so what do we do about this? And for, for anybody who's wondering, like, what do we do about this? I know this is promotion. I know this is marketing on my part. But the very first step, I would say, if you're a woman, come to our Blossoming Woman Level 1 workshop. If you're a man, come to Relationship Tools for Men Level 1. Because doing those Level 1 events, Rod and I have created those as the tools that we would have liked to have had at the beginning of our journey. They're the tools that give you permission to explore who you are as a sexual being, give you space to open up as a woman or to open up as a man, gives you space to explore vulnerably topics that you might not cover in your everyday life and really does set up a whole new foundation for life. So our intention with those level one events is having teachings, practices, sharings that support a whole new foundation and will give you a shift into a new way of living, relating, connecting. So let's go into a practice and then I'll come back to some of my other discussion points for tonight. But for the, the two men who sent me that very similar question, I hope that I've answered your question and um, if there's something that I haven't addressed in your question, perhaps just send me um, a message in Messenger in case I've missed something. 
but let's do a practice so that the people at home can um, drop in and embrace their sexual desire. So just closing your eyes, place one hand over your heart and have the other hand cupping your genitals, so either your penis or your vulva and taking some breaths in through the nose and out through the mouth. And your hands are just resting on your body, just using your hands to connect with the genitals, with the heart, without putting any pressure or stimulation, but just connecting to these parts of the body. And I want you to imagine that as you inhale, you're expanding through the lungs. As the lungs expand, feeling the movement of the diaphragm, the abdominal muscles, and perhaps even feeling a stretch down into the pelvic floor. So that as you, in, as you inhale, if you breathe deeply, you'll feel a pulse all the way down into the pelvic floor and into your genitals. Relaxing your jaw, keeping your breath full and deep, jaw relaxed, neck relaxed, shoulders relaxed. <sighs> Back and belly relaxed, groin and buttocks relaxed. And wherever you're sitting, just bring your torso off from the back of your couch or the back of your chair so you've got some room to move a little so that as you inhale, you're going to rock forward in your pelvis and as you exhale, rocking back. Deep sigh on your exhale. Imagine your whole body relaxed and just letting there be a smile from your mouth through your whole body, like your organs are smiling, your muscles, your bones, your face, like everything's smiling as you rock forward with your inhale and back with your exhale. And a deep sigh out through the mouth. That sigh out through the mouth helps activate your sexual energy. And 
just quietly to yourself, you might just say yes with your exhale. Yes. 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 Breathing in to the sensations in your body, letting your heart and your whole body be open and saying yes to yourself, yes to the flow of aliveness that wants to move through your body. releasing the practice, releasing your body. <sighs> and I'd love to hear if you felt anything in your body during the practice. What did you notice? Was, did anything come up for you? Was there any sexual shame? Was there any sense of pleasure or aliveness? Just going to have a drink of my tea. I think we did the practice for maybe, maybe five or six minutes. I forget what the time was when we started. But even in five or six minutes, I can feel a nice tingling, an opening sensation through my body. There's a sense of feeling brighter, like so. Very, very simple things to do. And it can take no time at all. If you did that practice for five or ten minutes every day, I guarantee that you would start feeling more sexual energy, more sexual desire. Excuse me. Burping from my tea. Um, but if you did that practice for five or ten minutes every day, you'd feel more sexual energy, more sexual desire, but also more aliveness for life. Because when your sexual desire, when your sexual energy has been shut down for a long time, there is a part where your life force starts to feel diminished. Your life force starts to feel less than from the shutting down of sexual desire because then there's essential and an essential part of you that is not being expressed. It's like denying or cutting off part of yourself. And even if your partner is not interested sexually, you can still awaken that sexual desire for yourself through this kind of practice, through a self-pleasure practice. And, and self-pleasure is much more like conscious masturbation. So let's say typically masturbation looks like watching porn, fantasizing, and in a very hard and fast way, moving towards an outcome or moving towards a release. Whereas something that is a more conscious masturbation is about leaving behind the porn, leave behind the fantasy, say no to that results or outcome driven focus and just really start to tune in to breath, relaxation, awareness, sound, movement, so there's a sense of feeling and energy alive and moving in the body. And those five keys that I just mentioned, breath, sound, movement, relaxation and awareness, I cover those in our level one workshops in more detail. I'll read some of your comments here. So Nina says tingling, 
Deb says, my body came alive with tingles and buzzing energy moving around, some sexual shame around the rocking motion, and, and that stops the energy for her. Gina says, I definitely feel much more relaxed and alive and present now. Danny says, could feel energy in my groin, that which then moved up my spine, a tingling. Ali says, lots of tingles and aliveness to begin with. And as we went along and we rocked our pelvis, I felt orgasmic waves rise. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you all for being so, so beautiful and generous in your, your sharing and your personal reflections. I love it. So coming back to our sexual desire is not dependent on anyone else or anything else. Just doing these simple things that we did now, connecting with our body, connecting with the genitals, opening the heart, relaxing the body, that sense of the inner smile, but also discovering the internal yes. All those things combined, just over five minutes, gave people an opportunity to feel sexual energy in the body. So instead of waiting for your partner to feel sexual, instead of waiting for your partner to invite you to be sexual, it's important for each of us as individuals to give ourselves permission for our sexual energy, to give ourselves permission for our desire, because it's in giving ourselves permission that energy can move. An orgasm itself is really just energy moving in the body. People think it's much more complex. People often think that orgasm has to be as dramatic and wild and, and um, explosive as what you might see in porn. But orgasm can be as simple as a rolling motion through the body. It can be as simple as Ah, just surrendering to those waves as they want to move through the body. So saying yes to those waves, saying yes to some of our internal subtleties can open us up to much deeper, wider and expansive orgasmic capacity. And that also is part of the journey then of reclaiming life force because yes if you have been holding your sexual desire back or suppressing your sexual desire for a long time there is a sense that life force becomes diminished i find often people who are let's say a little older who haven't had sex for a long time start to become very fearful, very contracted in their body and lose some of their shine, start to look maybe more pale in colour, maybe they start seeing the world smaller and smaller and holding a lot of fear and contraction. Whereas I know old, older people who are sexually active who are still shining, who are still quite youthful and, and don't buy into a lot of that fear because they've kept the energy moving through their body. I think friendship and companionship is a very important part of a long-term relationship. So that needs to be included as part of a healthy long-term relationship, the same as Sex needs to be included as part of a healthy, uh, as part of a healthy long-term relationship. The other things I wanted to share around sexual desire, just a few more points and, and one more question before we wind up tonight, but is to recognize that of course sexual desire will change over your lifetime and will change inside of a relationship. So you know, I'm, I'm really aware that they're in the, Rod and I have been together almost four years. So in that time, there are times when my sexual desire has gone missing. Um, we've also been through some really significant stress, both individually and together. And stress can be a big killer of sexual desire. 
And so for me, when I know that my sexual desire is missing, I know that something's out of balance. I need to come back to taking care of myself physically, taking care of myself emotionally and connecting with those deeper layers of my feminine energy and instead of being so outward to pull the energy inwards. There of course is part where in a long-term relationship where the friendship and the companionship meets a lot of the, the ongoing needs and so the sexual urge or the sexual urgency is not as strong. However, if people wait until they feel like they're, they're sexy enough or their body's in the right shape or they wait for all the right conditions, then sex will never happen. I find one of the things that has me want sex more is actually having a really deep, quality, connected experience of sex. Like when, when Rod and I have a really beautiful sexual experience, which does happen often, but I know that, that when it is really beautiful and deep and connected, I feel myself like more sexy afterwards, more open afterwards, a little bit of like, oh, I wonder when we're going to do that again. And sometimes, like all people, it's like sometimes we have an ordinary sexual experience. And if we have an ordinary sexual experience, are we like, yeah, you know, not so excited about the next time. Um, but something will happen. It'll be like the way Rod looks at me or the way he touches me. I will feel the desire in his body or I will feel something stir in my body and that'll bring us back into connection. And it's not about waiting for the other person because also knowing that, that Rod's been you know, up and down with his health in the last couple of years, there's been times when I know that his desire hasn't been as close to the surface and so then I will play with my sexual desire. I'll just walk past him and caress my body and look at him in a certain way. And then he remembers that he's a sexual being. So this is part of the dance of partnership is that we can each be igniting and evoking each other's sexiness, each other's feelings, each other's desire. And um, it's evoking that desire in each other that has to start from a place of giving yourself permission to feel sexual energy in your body. So if I don't give myself permission for me to feel it, Rod can't feel that in me. And equally, if he doesn't give himself permission, I can't feel it. A lot of people wait for their partners to make it okay. But when you wait for your partner or you wait for somebody else to make your sexual desire okay, you end up holding your own desire hostage. So it's very important to be true to your own desire, be true to the feelings in your body. Uh, let's see, what else is on my list? Uh, I think I've already shared all those points. Feeling sexual desire in your body makes you more attractive. Um, I did say this earlier, but I know for me, the more deeply committed I am to my personal practice, where I'm connecting to pleasure, to movement, to sound every day, the more magnetic my body is and the more Rod feels me sexually, the more his desire builds up. Um, and equally, the, the deeper he's going in his meditation practices, the more he's building up that sense of presence and stillness, I can feel him more, more in his strength and his masculine qualities. And I'm drawn to him then. So each one of us at an individual level can make a difference in our partner's lives. I have a question which I'm going to read from my phone as I received it just before we started. Um, but while I'm looking for the question, I invite you to, to perhaps um, 
share into the chat box um, anything that you've noticed or anything that is alive for you from this discussion this evening. Ah, Deb, good question. Yes, I will come back to that. Uh, let's see. Now, a woman asked me this afternoon. She was talking about how her body is very sensitive. Um, I won't read it all in detail, but she's recognised that sensitivity is both a superpower and her kryptonite. Um, and she has a challenge around her kundalini energy, which is the sexual energy or the life force. That kundalini energy is very awakened and sensitive. If she's on a date and there's there's some chemistry, her energetic field becomes quite sensitized too. It's okay if, if the guy has experience in the tantric community, she can explain it. If the guy has no, no knowledge of tantra or kundalini, it's often mistaken as a green light for jumping into deeper physical intimacy. It doesn't help that I may even experience orgasmic waves from him simply placing his hand at the base of my spine or other light touching before even sharing a kiss. I'm concerned about the impression it gives, how to explain it and a degree of anxiety about whether it, would, whether it will activate during a first date and send signals that influence the date on a physical level and preclude my desire for honesty and compatibility on a values and belief level. I also notice my attempts to suppress the energy and I don't believe that to be healthy either. I don't wish to rerun old patterns of suppressing my aliveness and numbing myself anymore. Um, cool, well thank you for that question. That's a really, really great question. What I would say, and having been through this myself in my own journey of awakened kundalini energy and being very sensitive to touch and different experiences is that you need to be really upfront in having the conversation with somebody you know if you're on a first date to go I feel a little shy I feel a little nervous my body's highly sensitized and so sometimes energy starts to run through me kind of like kind of like orgasmic energy um, starts to get activated sometimes from the slightest thing and I'm interested in getting to know you I'm not sure if I want to have a physical or a sexual relationship with you but I need to tell you this up front so that we don't get off on the wrong foot so I think being up front about it as much as it may feel uncomfortable and a little awkward you then have the opportunity to express your feelings about it, your vulnerability, the beauty of your energy being so sensitive and so open, but also the downside of like, this can be a challenge because I'm scared of giving you the wrong impression before I'm ready to open up physically. So that way you get to let a man know exactly where you are and if he respects and responds to that even if he's never heard of kundalini even if he's never heard of tantra if he responds to that in a respectful and honoring way then you're interested in a second date with him if he hears that and responds in a somewhat sleazy or disrespectful way then you're not very likely to go on a second date so in some way that becomes part of your sorting process and this is what I see dating as it's a sorting process so you share something that is quite central to who you are it's it's something that's a big part of what you know about yourself and you want that energy to be alive and you could even say you know I'm not interested in suppressing or holding back my sensitivity anymore which is why I need to share this but I also don't want to give you the wrong idea because I'd much prefer getting to know you getting to know who you are what's important to you what your values are sharing what my values are before we develop a physically intimate relationship so that way all your cards are on the table and um, yeah based on 
how he responds to your cards being on the table as to what the next step is. So I hope that helps you and feel free to send me send me a question privately if you have further questions about that. But that's certainly how I've approached similar situations in the past. Uh, let me see. Danny's, uh, Danny says, Lee asked about presence in a woman. Um, yes, Danny, he did. That was when I asked for future date night topics. So I'm actually not going to speak to that one tonight, but it is definitely on my list for a future date night topic. So yeah, it doesn't relate so much to sexual desire. Um, Deb reminded me, and I knew someone would remind me, that's awesome. Um, you mentioned about different types of sex to suit different times and needs. Can you talk about that, please? Yes. So there are times when, you know, sex is slow and gentle and nourishing and there's a lot of tenderness in it. And there'll be other times where sex is wild and fast and, and hungry and passionate. And then there's all sorts of in-betweens. And um, I think, you know, early, early in a relationship, it's quite common for there to be lots of hunger in the sex. And then the more, the more the relationship builds and evolves and grows, the tenderness starts to come in, more of the vulnerability starts to come in. And I know for me personally, this can even vary throughout different times of the month, depending where I am in my cycle as to the kind of sex that I want to have. You know, depending on what's been going on for me emotionally as to the type of sex I want to have. Um, I think Rod shared on here a couple of weeks ago that there are times when we've been making love and I've, you know, pounded on his chest and kind of like <coughs> screamed and roared in his face and he'll just be lying there going like, yeah, give me more, give me more. And um, there's something in him being encouraging and inviting and evoking my feelings in the midst of sex that's incredibly freeing and liberating. And there can also be different stages in a relationship, like, you know, after, um, after Rod had his accident two years ago, our sex was much more simple and it, there was more stillness in it. But there was also a lot of deep emotional intimacy because we'd just been through something quite significant together um, and Rod was dealing with his physical vulnerability, I was dealing with the vulnerability of our relationship changing. So also in that, sex changed for us. Um, and there'll be times where, you know, Rod will approach me sexually in a way where he's like, I can feel him, he wants to claim me and, you know, like, penetrate me as deeply as he can like in the not just the physical but the energetic sense and that'll have this kind of like Rah! to it and then there'll be other times when I can feel that the sex is all about the connection and the softness and the closeness um, so that's something to to even look at like in addressing the earlier question of what needs does sex um, satisfy for you so there'll be there'll be sometimes where sex is satisfying my need to be expressive and that could be my you know expressive could include crying it could include roaring it could include you know being like really wild and free um, there'll be other times where sex is all about just being held and nurtured and loved um, yeah, so I hope that speaks to, to that question, Deb, and thanks for reminding me. Carlo says, are men more wanting it, which I'm going to assume is sex, than women, generally speaking? I did speak to this earlier, Carlo, but just to recap, is that I have met a lot of women 
including myself at different times in my life, who have wanted more sex than their male partners. When a woman is open, her sexual appetite, her sexual desire is much stronger than a woman who is not open. Now, I say not open rather than closed because saying closed would feel somehow derogatory or putting a woman down. But when I say about a woman opening sexually, what's important to understand is that most women have a longing to open. And oftentimes that longing has been deeply buried. And so finding out what's the key to open her longing is part of opening a woman sexually. But you can pretty safely assume that every woman has a longing to open. It's just that she may need help being loved, cherished, respected, honoured, cared for, so that her longing opens up. And um, yeah, of course it's going to vary from man to, to woman, but um, I have met a lot of, a lot of women with um, very big sexual desires and sexual appetites um, because they knew the power of that energy within them. And women are incredibly powerful sexually when they understand that energy. So I'm going to wind up there for tonight and in winding up, if you can just share into the chat box what it is you're taking with you tonight and how you feel in this moment. For any of the singles who are watching, we still have some places left for date night for singles coming up this Saturday. It's 5 p.m. to 7.30 Saturday. It's on Zoom. Joanne sends you out Zoom link and instructions for it. Um, so, yeah, if you're interested in date night for singles, I think at this stage we have more women booked in than men. So definitely if you're a man and you're interested in understanding women, understanding relationships, dating a little bit more, having some um, conversations with new women, sharing some energetic practices, then join me Saturday night for Date Night for Singles. And thanks Carlo for your question, perfectly okay and I'm glad to hear that that you feel okay. Maybe you're the only person who's still here, Carlo, or the others are, are a minute or so behind in, in listening. It's hard to know fully how this Facebook Live experience works because sometimes people's responses to my questions come through automatically and sometimes people's responses um, are a little bit delayed. So I don't know whether it depends on the internet speed of the people watching, I'm, I'm not really 100% sure. Um, a reminder that I will be back next Wednesday. I'm going to speak about vulnerability. I'll be sharing more about my own personal journey of vulnerability and how I journey with that and support myself to go deeper into who I am, a sense of really embracing and loving my vulnerability and letting the layers fall away as they do. So that'll be, yeah, next Wednesday, 7 o'clock Facebook Live for the vulnerability discussion. Nina says, loved that video. I'm smiling and keeping the good energy. Awesome. And it's morning time for you, Nina. So enjoy your day. Ali says, lots of distinctions and tweaks. Very grateful for your insight. Thank you. Danny says, thank you, feeling good. Deb says, I'm taking with me a reminder of what I already know from you and I'm feeling sexual energy pulsing in me. I'm tired and feeling vulnerable. Andy says, thanks for another session full of wonderful wisdom and insight. Danny says, woo. Carl says, re-date night. Ah, oh, you'll do your best re-date night. Awesome. Well, thank you all for being here.
<laughs> and a hoo as well, Daddy. I get a whoop and a hoop. Um, Jean says, I'm processing a lot of your generous wisdom. Thank you so much. Thank you all for being here. Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday evening and I will see you all online or in person somewhere sometime soon. Good night.